All right. Good morning, everyone. We're gonna we're going to get started. Um, we are very excited to be spending an hour of our morning with Paula Marucci. My name is Dana Slowinski, and I am co-founder and owner of Family Recovery Centers. Uh, I'd like to take just a quick minute to tell everyone about Family Recovery Centers. We are in evening adolescent intensive outpatient program. We have locations in Lake Bluff, Hoffman Estates, St. Charles, and we have a fourth site coming soon. So stay tuned for details on that. Um, we do, we are a DBT intensively trained program, um, and we work with a wide range of adolescents struggling with maladaptive behaviors and mood disorders. Um, we also, two program components I'd like to highlight. First, we have a strong family component. So parents are actually on site with their adolescents two of the four evenings, and they're learning the skills right along with their child, and then they're also doing their own work. So we're really working to change that family system. Um, and then we also have a 24-7 on-call uh, where our clinicians are available both to patients and parents 24-7 for skills coaching and to help in real life. So not just when they're with us, but actually in real life as well. Um, we That is a very quick nutshell because I do wanna to get to our presentation. So if you have any questions or would like to talk further about the program, please feel free to email me. I will put my email in the chat box. Um, and also I wanted to say we are growing obviously and expanding. And so with that, we are hiring across um, all of our sites. So if you know of anyone that's interested, please also send their information my way uh, via email. And um, with that, I would love to introduce Paula Marucci. She is truly an expert in the field of EMDR and disassociation. She is an EMDR approved consultant and an EMDR certified therapist. She's a national trainer for EMDR Consulting, LLC. She's a speaker and facilitator for advanced training, introduction to structural disassociation, ego state therapy, and EMDR therapy. And she's a workshop provider on trauma and disassociation. So those are just a couple of the hats that Paula wears. Um, and with that, Paula, we couldn't be more excited. So I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Dana. Um, I love presenting for this organization. Uh, I've known, um, uh, the organization for years back when they only had one location in Lake Bluff and uh, it's just wonderful to see how much they've grown. It doesn't surprise me one bit bringing in that family system and using DBT skills right there in itself is a model that is hard to find. So anyway, I'm here to present for you dissociation. What is it and why it is important? Um, instead of me doing the whole presentation, just on the first slide. I'm like about to tell you everything that I was going to say, but here's the slide. So just a little bit about myself. I think Dana just uh, described. I have. I do wear a lot of hats. I love all the hats that I wear. I'm all about the learning. Um, when I became an EMDR therapist, I realized that I needed to know about dissociation. And so that's why I'm doing the dissociation piece, especially in this current environment. How I became a therapist to begin with, this is my third career. Um, I was in finance uh, down at the Board of Trade in my first life. My second life, I raised my children the best I could. And then my third life is here uh, working with addiction was really my calling. And when I dealt with addiction, I kind of dug underneath and found trauma, realized that talking about trauma wasn't really getting us anywhere, especially when I was doing my own talk therapy found EMDR, found it very transformative. That's the word transformative because it really rewrites the encoding in your brain from your young times in life. And then um, moving into uh, being coming a teacher. Uh, I had a lot of learning disabilities when I was younger and I have found that my teaching style can really assist with sharing what can be complex information with everybody. So that's kind of one of my goals. I am a basic trainer. I train across the country. We've been doing a lot of virtual trainings lately. This is just an example of my crew. I've got about 13 people that work with me. Um, these are my angels here. I call them my angels. Uh, we are doing trainings in Gurney and Naperville this year. Uh, the, we have virtual trainings that will be out in the middle of the year, but this is just an example of one of uh, the things that I do in my free time. And then also I am a, a facilitator and a presenter for an advanced training with Barnes Perth Logan Seen out on the East Coast. 
And we do a really, really nice two day weekend talking about structural dissociation, ego states and EMDR. And just think about EMDR is the trauma tool that helps um, clinicians become trauma informed. And then once you get that tool under your belt, then we just move forward with the work that we need to do with dissociation. Because 75, 80% of the time when you work with a client, you pull out those EMDR tools, you're gonna be running into dissociation. But it doesn't have to be EMDR. It can be any trauma informed tool that you're gonna be using. Hence what we're gonna be talking about today. The model that we use is the hear it, see it, do it. This is a model that's important to me specifically since I have uh, dyslexia and also I'm a very visual person. I would not be teaching these trainings if it wasn't for the model that we were using. So knowledge is, knowledge is power. We're gonna empower you today as therapists because dissociation can be scary. I know in the beginning when I started to work with dissociation, I was terrified of it. And so it was something that I didn't have control over and I'm kind of a control freak, I admit it, but you know, I'm still in that situation. I am a very knowledgeable um, teacher and a clinician. I have a full caseload that I work with during the week and I still am uncomfortable with some of my clients because they're so dissociative. So it's a learning curve. You have to have faith in the work that we're doing. And so that's why I'm here today. I just wanna share with you a little bit about what dissociation is and give you a tool you can use no matter what. So we're going to hear it with the knowledge. The see it part is how we increase your learning um, retention because we talk about it, we hear it, we see it. And then in the trainings that I do, we get to do it. We're not going to be able to do that today in an hour's worth of time, but doing it is the most important aspect. Just getting out there and doing it. So our objectives today. Uh, the number one objective is that you're going to understand uh, how dissociation um, affects our clients and then utilizing the window of tolerance to understand what is dissociative for a client and what is not. And then we're going to transition into using the dissociative experience scale. The dissociative experience scale, we refer to it as the DS, is a screening tool. Okay, it's not used to diagnose, but it is a screening tool to assist you as therapists to get an idea of how dissociative your clients are. We all need to understand our client's clinical landscape. And so if you wanna know specific to dissociation, then this is the tool for you. It's not overwhelming, it's not too long, and we've made it fun. So that's gonna be the, um, the main focus of this particular hour together. And then I'm also gonna hone in on when you use that DS, how can that be a learning experience for you while you're assessing your clients? Because that's how it's been set up. And I'll show you that as we move along. So dissociation, what is it and why is it important? First of all, it's the client's capability of leaving conscious awareness. They're able to escape, they're able to contain, and they're able to store so that, we, so that they don't remember. They're able to detach. These are important words that we're gonna be seeing coming up when it comes to assessing a client's ability to associate. So one more time, they're able to escape, they're able to contain their memories in parts of the brain so that they don't remember, and they're able to detach from themselves from the external world and disappear. Um, can we do, we're gonna do the video first. Dana, are you doing it? I actually have Ryan doing it. Okay, can we, I'm just gonna stop share. Can you guys play it so I don't get, have problems? Yeah, there we go. Is it working? Ryan, I think you need to unmute. Yeah, I can't hear it. And if it could be enlarged. There we go. Sorry, I know Ryan's got a lot that she's doing right now. Mm -mm -mm. Yours. Do you feel distant from your emotions, thoughts, surroundings, and memories? This is part of something called dissociation. 
Dissociation is a defense mechanism where you unconsciously push away conflicting or threatening emotions and compartmentalize feelings so that you don't have to deal with them. Within the umbrella of dissociative symptoms, there are two that help categorize the experience, detachment dissociation and compartmentalization dissociation. Detachment dissociation refers to feeling like you have been taken out of your body. Compartmentalization dissociation refers to when your mind pushes aside distressing moments or experiences. This usually results in memory loss. With that said, here are five signs you may be experiencing dissociation. Number one, memory loss. Memory loss is a common symptom of dissociation. You may find yourself at work or school, but unable to remember how you got there. Memory loss is one of the quickest symptoms to identify because it's obvious. The main reason memory loss goes hand in hand with dissociation is because your brain cannot handle whatever is going on. So it switches to autopilot. Dissociation pulls you outside of your body. Hence, it's difficult for you to remember what happens around you if you're not there. But these moments of dissociation don't always occur when we are frightened or distressed. They could sometimes happen while you're doing something. Number two, derealization. Derealization is another symptom of dissociation. It sometimes feels like a dream where things are colorless, dull, or blurry. Derealization is distressing and can cause anxiety, but it's common for those with anxiety, depression, and other mental illnesses. However, derealization differs from other psychotic disorder symptoms in the sense that there is a degree of awareness. You are aware of reality and the feeling that distances you from it. Number three, feeling lightheaded. There are many reasons why you may feel lightheaded. But in the context of mental health, dissociation can be a cause. When lightheadedness is paired with another one of the symptoms mentioned above, then the cause is most likely dissociation. The vestibular system is a sensory system responsible for spatial awareness and sense of balance. However, when you dissociate, you are not aware of your surroundings. When you come to, the sudden realization of your surroundings serves almost as vestibular stimulation and makes you lightheaded. Number four, not feeling pain. Another sign of dissociation is not feeling pain. There is research suggesting that dissociation not only minimizes painful memories, but also the physical pain attached to them. However, the connection between dissociation and pain is not solely related to trauma. People who experience chronic pain can also experience dissociation. For some who experience dissociation as a result of a mental health condition, the feeling of not feeling in your body can sometimes lead you to self-injure. Although it makes sense to do something to bring you back into your body, self-injury is not the best option. And number five, a loss of self-identity. Another aspect of dissociation is depersonalization. It's similar to derealization in the sense that you feel like you are watching yourself. However, depersonalization makes you feel distant from your mental process. You feel that you're an observer of your own life. Depersonalization can occur with other symptoms on this list. It can be a very scary feeling, like you don't have any control over your body. Some clinicians believe that extreme stress or trauma can produce depersonalization. So do you relate to any of these signs? Dissociation can be frightening and in some cases intrusive. It's not like a physical illness where diagnosis and treatment are administered via exams, but there is treatment, among them being psychotherapy, medication, family therapy, and clinical hypnosis. If you experience any of these symptoms, please reach out to a medical health professional for treatment. Please like and share this with friends that might find some good advice in the video as well. Make sure to subscribe to Psych2Go and hit the notification bell for more content. All the references used are added in the description box below. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. I always feel like I'm I, it would be responsible to only allow them to do their advertisement since I'm using their video. Okay, is the um, uh, slideshow back up? It is. Okay, good. All right, great. So the reason why we use that video is for you to start to hear the language. We're going to be talking about specifically derealization, depersonalization, and amnesia throughout this entire presentation. Um, I'm color coding the language because hopefully all of you have access to the color coded DF, uh, DS right now. Uh, it was something that I asked to have sent out. And this is going to be the tool that we're going to be learning. Okay. And this is the dissociative experiences scale. And this is what we use as a screening tool. 
in order to understand our client's clinical landscape and how much dissociation our client is experiencing. But while we do that, we also want to start learning about dissociation. We want to start learning about what these words mean. And if, if you dissociate, then you will have an idea of what it feels like to experience derealization, depersonalization. But for a lot of us, we don't know what that feels like. And so the best ways for us to learn is to learn from our clients. So when we do the DS and we talk to them about the questions that they're answering, we can get firsthand information on what the experience is like for them. And as you can imagine, the experience is going to be very um, uh, individual. So the two main categories that we're looking at here are going to be detachment, which is going to be to separate, depersonalization, derealization, and compartmentalization, which is the client's ability to separate um, and to compartmentalize maybe into different parts of self, but more importantly, memories. So you're going to have clients that may not have a decent amount of memories around what's going on. This is what the DS looks like. Like I said, I hope all of you are gonna be able to have a copy of this. The colors that I'm gonna be referring to today are gonna to be the pink because the pink is amnesia and that is compartmentalization, which is one of the main components of dissociation. And then the other is going to be the um, derealization, depersonalization. It comes up as a green blue and derealization, depersonalization are two different aspects and I'm going to separate them out when we talk about them, but when we look at the DES, we're looking at them as one category. Just to introduce the other ones, we have yellow, with it, which is absorption. Absorption is something that everybody experiences. So that's a way for us to know that the client is actually answering the questions and reading the questions. If you get zeros across the board on your absorption questions, then you probably wouldn't be able to utilize the information because there's something not um, right because everybody absorbs to some extent. So first we're gonna talk about depersonalization and derealization. As I said, there are two, ask, two components to dissociation. There's detachment and compartmentalization. So detachment is the combination of depersonalization and or derealization. Now I'm gonna be honest with you, for years, I couldn't figure out what these words meant. I couldn't remember which one was which, what exactly they were talking about. It's just not something that I've experienced. But now that I've had enough clients that have marked on their screening uh, tool that they do experience it, and I've asked them what that entails, I have a really good idea, the best that I can without experiencing it myself, what depersonalization and derealization is. And it is an altered state of consciousness by a sense of separation. And there's that word detachment again. We are detaching from the self. We are detaching from everyday experiences, from self and that external world. So depersonalization examples did not happen to me, did not happen to self. It did not happen to me. I could see it happening to someone else but it was not me. It basically takes you out of the experience. You can be watching it happening to yourself, but it's not happening to you. And then derealization, not in one's body, out of the body. I was outside of my body and could not feel my legs. We hear all kinds of things. Um, you're gonna have clients outside of your body and then parts of the body are gonna be telling you what happened. So it's, it's um, a matter of just getting used to and having a way to understand like how your clients can be utilizing the language to describe their experience to you. When we look at the DS, we're looking at depersonalization and derealization as one category. So just to give you an idea of the questions that we're gonna be asking our clients and then how they line up, if a client says that they find themselves standing next to oneself, we're looking at derealization. There's a question that says looking in the mirror and not recognizing oneself. If the client scores anything above a 20 on that, you're gonna be wanting to ask them, can you tell me what it is that you see when you look in the mirror? 
Um, give me examples. How long has that been happening? And that's our question 11. Um, having the experience of feeling that other people, objects in the world around them are not real. That's gonna be depersonalization. That's number 12. Having the experience of feeling that their body does not belong to them. Number 13, having the experience of being in a familiar place, but finding it strange and unfamiliar and feel as if they are looking at the world through a fog so that people or objects appear far away and unclear. When you're doing this DES with your clients, you're gonna get scores of zero to 100. I get 80s and 70s and 60s around a client talking about looking in the mirror and not seeing themselves. So that's gonna make me very curious, right? And so I'm gonna to want to go back and do what we call a clinical interview and have the client share with me different experiences, what that must be like for them. And another, a really important question, how long has that been happening? Is this something that's been happening their entire life? All good information. So once again, this is the component detachment. Now we're gonna look at the second component of dissociation, which is compartmentalization. And this is amnesia, okay? So when you're looking at your DES and you see your pink questions, those are gonna be your questions around amnesia. Conscious characteristics, um, which are the ability to bring normal accessible information into uh, you know it, it's unconscious characteristics. Anyway, you're bringing information into unconscious and you are not, um, and you are storing it away. So in other words, there's gonna be memory loss. There's gonna be memory loss that can be, I don't remember what I did yesterday. I went to the grocery store, I bought groceries, they're on my counter, I don't remember buying them. There's gonna be memory loss, like I don't remember the first 12 years of my life. This is all um, examples of amnesia. And amnesia is, um, there's three questions that pertain to amnesia in the DES, finding oneself in a place and having no idea how they got there. There's a big difference between, um, you know, driving down the highway and all of a sudden passing your exit and thinking, oh, geez, I was just totally zoning out. That's very different. That's actually absorption then getting to the mall, parking, going into the mall and looking around and saying, when did, I, when did I come here? I mean, this is what our clients experience. Having no memory for some important event in their lives, weddings, birthday parties, um, going back into life, we have a lot of clients that um, have blocks of uh, many years of memory that they don't remember. And finding evidence that they have done things that they don't remember doing. Once again, the clinical interview is really important because I can have a client that says, well, I just found three Amazon boxes in my closet and I don't remember buying these things. And I wanna say, join the club, like, you know, especially lately. Yes, that would happen. But on the other hand, if it's, you know, I purchased um, and uh, got insurance for, um, you know, my jewelry and I'm spending $1,000 a month on it, you know, something that, that um, is more significant. We want to know what that is, what that looks like, and then how often it's happening and how long it's been happening, how far back it goes into the client's life. So we've talked about amnesia and we've talked about derealization and depersonalization. And on our DS, there are five categories. And these, so we've talked about two of the main categories because derealization and depersonalization are put together. We're gonna spend a brief moment talking about the other three categories as we move on. And then I'm gonna show you um, how the thing, why the thing was created the way that it was. So the key here is that any treatment modality can be derailed by the complex, by complex trauma and dissociative symptom. There's a lot of trainings out there that'll say, how do you know if your client's dissociative? You know, are they falling asleep? Are they yawning? Um, are they daydreaming? Are they staring off into space? But instead, and it's probably because I come from a math background, I'm gonna give you a tool. I just want you to have a tool. You put it in your intake, all of the trainings that I do. I've trained hundreds of trauma-informed therapists. We require the DES to be done uh, right off the bat, especially in this environment. 
dissociation um, is uh, evolves out of a lack of safety. And when you move into, and we'll talk more about this with the window of tolerance, but when you move into a hyper arousal, I'm in danger state and the danger doesn't go away. That's when the client collapses into a dissociation. And with our pandemic, we were in danger for many, many months with no answers. And so we've seen more dissociation now than we've ever seen. In fact, it is the number one topic on all of the consultation that I do. So it doesn't have to be MDR therapy, it can be any modality. And so understanding, like I said, the client's clinical landscape, it's important to know how dissociative, dissociative they are, no matter what kind of therapist you are. So complex trauma, uh, the, a real quick piece on the PTSD diagnosis, 1985, we got a PTA, PTSD diagnosis that requires a criterion A event, one event. Dissociation evolves out of experiences that come from childhood that happen over and over and over. And those um, adverse experiences, for example, are going to be child abuse that can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be sexual. And most importantly, it can be just neglect. And these are considered maladaptive experiences. And what happens is when we're working with our clients, no matter what modality we're using, we're trying to link, bind, or connect new, um, the negative and maladaptive experiences to anything that's positive and adaptive. And there's all kinds of different um, therapies out there that you can work on to strengthen and enhance those positive neural networks for our clients. But the problem is, is that the way that complex trauma is stored in the brain, it cannot link onto, it cannot glob onto anything that's adaptive because the way it's stored is in pieces and in fragments. So depending on when and how often the client dissociates, um, there are different levels of dysfunction and mental disorders that you're gonna be dealing with. So we're gonna see dissociation and addiction and bipolar and um, borderline personality. You're going to see it in anxiety and in depression. You're going to see it everywhere. And so that's kind of why I really feel that we need an education and dissociation, no matter what clientele we're working with. Everybody experienced the trauma in the last two years. And for some people, it was a terrifying trauma. One thing about trauma that's really important is the past is present. When a client is triggered, they are re-experiencing the trauma like it is happening today. And that is about how maladaptively it is stored in the brain. So first of all, these negative experiences are gonna be in implicit memory and they will be very easily triggered and the client won't see it coming. That there is um, no way to have it link, find, or connect to any type of adaptive experience until you can um, work with the central nervous system and that window of tolerance to help the client be able to um, hold the trauma without becoming so dysregulated that they end up dissociating. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then um, also the trauma that's stored, that's stored in fragments, have absolutely no tags for time and place. So the client does not know what is happening. If I got bit by a dog at the age of five and I see a dog that's walking across my parking lot out my window right here, and I can see that the, uh, the um, owner doesn't have a leash on, my body will tense up because I am gonna start re-experiencing the trauma that I experienced when I was five. There's no indication whatsoever that now I'm an adult that I'm even in a separate room that I could call 311, all of my resources. I'm gonna go back to being that five-year-old and that's how trauma works. And so if, my, um, if I'm overwhelmed by seeing that dog and I needed to dissociate as a child in order to deal with being terrified of dogs, then I'm automatically gonna to go to the coping strategy that is there for me today, that is in service of my survival that is adaptive and I'm gonna dissociate right now. And that's how it works. So what do we wanna do? 
we want to pay continuous attention to maintaining the client in present time. And we do a lot of this work in our um, therapy anyway. We call it dual attention and awareness. We want the client to be able to put one foot into the trauma memory and keep one foot present with us. It's when the client goes into the memory and is reliving that memory without us where we get into trouble in our therapeutic work. And so dual attention uh, being um, present time orientation is gonna be this piece with the window of tolerance because the window of tolerance gives us a very nice visual for us to um, be able to assess where the client is. So understanding that window of tolerance can be helpful. We can show the client the window of tolerance and we can have the client leave the session and work on assessing where they are in their window of tolerance throughout the week. I always like to say, and I, got, I get this from Catherine Martin, that we as therapists are always on the window sill. We walk fine lines. You know, we're supposed to work with our, clamas, our clients' most dysregulating experiences. And yet we're also supposed to keep them in their window of tolerance to make sure they don't get too dysregulated or dissociate. It's, it's, a, it's a tough order. So we work on the windowsill and we need to figure out how to slide in and out of that window of tolerance. And really in order to um, predict how dissociative the client can get, we're gonna be using the DS as our screening tool beforehand so that we have a measurement. Traumatic material will need to be carefully titrated, fractionated and or pennulated in order to maintain the window of tolerance. Ergo, we keep the client mindful and present. This is our ultimate goal for all of us, no matter what orientation we use. We want to titrate material in that we want the material to not be as intense. We want to fractionate the material by um, chunking it off into very small pieces of points of disturbance. And we want to pendulate them back from what's calm and peaceful and mindful into the trauma memory and then back safely. Uh, my two favorite quotes um, from two of my favorite uh, uh, people, basically, slower is faster in working with dissociative clients. We need to slow it down because the clients are getting too overwhelmed. And then Dini Laliotis, who's my consultant, we need to do the work before the work. Once again, when we're working with dissociation, we have a plan, we have an orientation, we know what we like to do, but when there's dissociation, we need to do some work before that. Understanding the window of tolerance. Um, well, you know, this is interesting because I just read the slide, but I like this picture better. So I'm gonna make sure I switch that up. But we work on the window sill. Ding. Here's our window of tolerance. Window of tolerance, how can we utilize it to determine the client's clinical landscape and treatment plan? So there are a number of different window of tolerance visuals out there. This is one of my favorites. I also have one other one that I really like. And basically what we're talking about is we want our client to be in this comfort zone. We want them to be able to regulate themselves. So what are the tools that you use? There's some very, um, you know, there's, there's grounding, there's breathing, um, in the orientation that I use, we do secure your space. Uh, we actually create a container. Um, we have uh, imagery, calm place imagery that we use. The goal is we want our clients to be able to state shift. So if you're in the window of tolerance where your client is calm and um, able to be present with you and they're oriented to your office, and then you start talking about something, that starts to become distressing for them and they shift into a fight flight response, then there's that window sill and shifting into and out of the window of tolerance. And this would be moving into a hyper arousal state. A hyper arousal state is also con um, considered um, the um, sympathetic nervous system and it's an increased heart rate it is a fight flight, it is a mobilized state. It is a state where the client wants to um, fight or run. So there's energy that's needed. 
uh, blood's being pumped to the larger muscles. Um, and so that's why the heart rate is up. We have all kinds of symptoms here, anything from um, anger to uh, anxiety, being overwhelmed, uh, rigidness, overeating, restrictions, addictions, impulsivity. All of this requires some type of being mobilized to avoid or to um, get rid of or leave the danger. But what happens if that danger doesn't go away? What happens if you are experiencing a trauma and let's say there's a perpetrator involved, I'll try not to get too explicit, and that, that person's not going away and you're in the fight flight, but you can't flight, then we automatically drop down into hypo aroused state. And if you study polyvagal theory, this will make so much more sense because we're in our sympathetic nervous system, our um, ventral vagal, we uh, shift into the sympathetic and then into the parasympathetic dorsal vagal. And it's basically heart rate vari uh, variation. Our resting rate is here in our comfort zone. Our heart rate increases to above 110 beats per uh, minute. You're in hyper arousal. Your body's trying to figure out what to do. Your central nervous system has taken over. And then the danger doesn't go away. So then your heart rate drops and you go into a complete shutdown. And this is where dissociation is. You uh, feign a death response. You disappear. You pretend you're dead. You're not present. You're unavailable. You're disconnected. Opiates are released. So it's, it can be a very numbing experience. You're on autopilot. There's no display of emotions. You're separated from self feelings and emotion. This is where dissociation lives. And how did you get to that dissociation? Well, you needed to enter into hyper arousal first and then shift into a hypo arousal because there was never anything remedied around the danger that you were experiencing. So if you study polyvagal, um, let's see, I said the terms we wanted to talk about were hypo arousal, which is uh, the heart rate dropping to below resting and going into a place where we can disappear, maybe hide into that turtle shell. Hyper arousal, which is up here with our heart rate above 110 beats per minute. And we've got our client ready to go. Those muscles are all um, ready and, and they're strong and the heart rate's up and you're ready to fight your flight. And um, then we've got the normal window of tolerance. This is gonna be our resting heart rate. And this is gonna be what breathing, grounding, um, there are a lot of different tools that people use to get us into this comfortable zone. I think one more thing that's important to point out here is that when you enter into hyper or hypo arousal, you are leaving um, your ability to access your prefrontal cortex. So we call it being amygdala hijacked, right? And it's hard for our clients to access adaptive information. So if I have clients that come back from higher level of care and they come in and they've got all these great tools, DBT tools, and then they're at school and somebody threatens them and they automatically go into a hyper aroused state, it's really difficult for them to access all those tools they learned. So they're also gonna need to know, I think the psychoeducation, half of change is acknowledgement, knowledge is empowering, Daniel Siegel's name it to tame it. I think if they could understand that they can't access that information due to how their central nervous system is reacting, that that would take half of the blame off of them and help them understand that it's their body that's working against them right now because they have all these great intentions, but the minute they leave their window of tolerance, they can't access them. And that's, that's, that's a tough thing for especially adolescents. Those are, uh, I love to work with adolescents. So the key to that for me is to become polyvagal informed. You know, and if you really, really, really wanna do an hour on polyvagal, ask Fran, because I love talking about polyvagal. Um, I think polyvagal theory is very important. Dr. Stephen Porges was um, studying heart rate variability and he found that it wasn't just about fight flight. So we're not gonna go into that today because we don't have time. I better move along. But here are the books. These are all great books. This is, these are the books that I use in my office. 
uh, on polyvagal. Deb Dana does a great, great job of helping us all become polyvagal informed. Um, any of the presentations that I do are based off of her content. Okay, let's move back into um, moving toward our DES because I wanna make sure you leave this presentation knowing how to use it. So we're going to use the DS as our way to uh, decide how the, um, how the client dissociates. Dr. George Frazier, he is the um, doctor up in Ottawa who highlighted this in the different colors. He has a background, you don't have to read all this, this is actually for my other class, but he, um, I actually work with him and he has helped me understand how he has color coded this. He's not the one that created the DS, but he's the one that has put the color codes on there for his master level and PhD level students so that they can start learning what dissociation is, which to me was like, oh, well, of course, I need that too, because we want to learn as well. We don't want to just give them the screening tool and then not know what's going on, just use the results. So the DES was created by Carlson and Putnam. And then Dr. Frazier went in and he did what he calls an unofficial color coded version. Once again, to help therapists better understand what the tool is saying. And then when the client gives their answers, understanding uh, exactly what those aspects of dissociation mean. So you've seen this before, here it is again. We're gonna be measuring, it is a screening tool. It is not a diagnostic tool. So you're never going to diagnose somebody. I use the word never for real here. Never use this tool to diagnose somebody with a uh, dissociative disorder. But we do have a next step if the scores on this are high. And anything above um, a 30 is considered high. You take the 28 questions, you add them up, you divide them by 28. And if you have something above a 30, reach out. Reach out to somebody, reach out to me, you can reach out to anybody. George shares, Dr. George shares that the color coding, he's got five divisions. So he basically took the five most important aspects of dissociation. The first piece is yellow, which is absorption. And we don't really focus on the yellow. We use the yellow absorption questions as a way to determine if the client is engaged in the in this tool or not because absorption is something that happens to everybody, okay? So that's not something that we're gonna hone in on. But the green, the depersonalization and derealization is considered a high rank in dissociative potential, as well as the pink, which is the amnesia. And that's why I went over those two because they're really the most important. They're also the uh, key definition of dissociation. Remember, we have two components. We have detachment, and we have compartmentalization, detachment being depersonalization, derealization, and compartmentalization being amnesia. Once again, if depersonalization and derealization, just that language freaks you out, don't worry. Just remember it's green. The other colors on the DS, just so that you know why reinvent the wheel, try to figure it out for yourself, would be the orange. And it's called fantasy prone phenomenon. Fantasy prone, and this is kind of cool, is when a client can like literally hallucinate on demand. So I have a client that's capable of putting herself in a situation where she was a big snowboarder back in the day, and she can go into that experience like that, walking down the hall of um, the organization that she works at, sitting in a meeting. And it's, it's, it's a gift. It's a talent but it also can be very disruptive when you need to be productive. So the orange questions that are on here are all fantasy prone questions. So if you're curious as to what those look like, go ahead and read a couple um, after this, if you have the time. And then the ego states are really the most important thing. I don't know if anybody is doing any ego state work. Um, I know what the ego state uh, um, work looks like in the EMDR community, but ego states are gonna be probably the most important aspect of the DES because it's gonna be the parts of self that can block the work that you're gonna be doing in your office with your client. And so if you have a client that has a high score on the blues, then once again, 
you're going to want to reach out to figure out what to do next, because it means that you've got a client that not only has a lot of parts of self, but they know that they're parts of self, which means that it could be pretty easy to work with them. And that's not a difficult, um, uh, that's not a difficult training. I mean, dissociation and ego states can be a training for a lifetime, but it's not as hard as it sounds to get started if you've never heard of ego states. Um, you can start with, you know, with transactional analysis, which basically talks about ego states for everybody, including our, you and me. So what do you do with a DS score of greater than 20? You want to conduct a clinical interview with any questions that score over a 20 in all categories except absorption. Okay, so um, that means that you have four categories here. And if the clients are scoring, you know, 50, 60, 70, that red flag goes up. If it's like 30, 40, you're going to be asking them the, the questions like, tell me about how you answered this question. Give me some examples. Tell me some other times when you experienced this. And the reason why you want to do that is because, A, you're going to be understanding your client. Like I said, I like using that word clinical landscape. You're going to be understanding how they think, work, um, what works for them. But also, every time this question gets answered, you're going to be learning more about what these words mean. And so it's, it's a win-win, correct? Um, so, and like I said, for the absorption questions, if you get somebody that answers a number of the absorption questions with a high number, like just read them and ask them to tell you about it. It makes for an excellent therapy session. And then when we have our clients that are in their window or outside of their window of tolerance. Our goal is, is to be bringing them in back into the window of tolerance. All of these are ways that we can bring the client back in. So if you're on the windowsill and the client is, you've got a, a client that's got a higher DES score, which means that they're somewhat dissociative. These are the types of tools that you're gonna wanna use because when we work with dissociation, we're talking about fractionating, titrating, and pendulating. And I'm just going to give you the example of one of these. I had asked Ryan if she wanted me to do another hour presentation, and I would go over how to use these five tools if people were interested or not. But constant installation, it's a long, it's a long title. Constant installation of present orientation and safety. It's a very popular strategy that we use in my circles. And basically all it is, is you take your, your imagery around a calm, peaceful place. So let's say that client is about hiking up at Harms Woods, which is right down the street from me. And they're able to pull up the, the green trees and the birds chirping. And you have them get very grounded in that imagery. And then we take the distressing moment. So for me, it would be that five-year-old that got bit in the face by the dog. We want to take a snapshot of that, just a teeny weeny piece. So that would be the titrating part. And I'm going to um, uh, go with uh, just the dog's face about to bite me, like I'd see that visual. And we're going to pendulate back and forth. You're going to be in your calm hike seeing the trees, hearing the birds, feeling the crunch under your feet, feeling the breeze, what's coming up for you. I'm feeling relaxed, great, breath in, exhale out. And now we are going to slowly move over to that snapshot of the dog. Hold it, I'm with you here. And now let's go back. And we are moving back into our present orientation and safety. We do this for three seconds. We ask the client, what did they notice? What was that experience like for you? And then we ask, would you be okay? Always asking permission. Would you be okay if we tried it again, but this time we do it for five seconds. So once again, we start with the hike and we bring in all of the um, senses and then we move the client into the snapshot of the worst moment, which would be the dog and his face, not the whole dog bite, but just a fraction, just we fractionate it, points of disturbance. And then we bring them back, breath in and exhale out. And then we ask the client, how, what was that like for you? So as you can see, we are slowly um, exposing the client 
grounding them, exposing, grounding them, exposing. The goal is for the client to eventually be able to observe that visual and not absorb that visual. Okay, we're looking for a transformative change in that they can at some point be able to experience that visual and not be over um, stimulated and then need to shut down. I'll give you one more example here from this space. Um, picture in picture, I love this one because everybody's got a big screen TV these days. So you put your hike on the huge big screen TV. You have the client describe it for you. You know, we've got the trees, we've got like the, the woods and the flowers and we can hear the lake in the background because maybe we're up at uh, Picture Rocks and we have this huge picture and then we take the very small picture of whatever the trauma moment is. And we have the client put that wherever they want, out by the trees, on the path, wherever they want. And then they have a remote control. They can turn it on, they can turn it off, they can make it larger, they can make it smaller. And you give them complete control around the titration. And once again, then you pendulate. You have them focus on the big picture, get grounded in it, breathing, whatever grounding you need to do for your client. And then you shift them into the small picture, give them a couple seconds there, bring them back and then talk to them about it. Could we make it bigger? Should we make it smaller? Should we put it behind the tree? Can we put it out in the path in front of us? And just use this venue as a way to slowly integrate the trauma work into what is our stabilization. So anyway, those are just a couple examples. We've got a number of great tools that we can use. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do one more just because it's really helpful. In the clients, um, in your session, we've got um, the back of the head scale. We like to measure the dissociation. So when you are out here in front, the client is in the room with you, is present oriented. Um, they are mindful because the opposite of being mindful is dissociation. And we use this as a measurement. And when the client is in the back of their head, the brainstem, this is when they are in the memory and they're reliving the memory and they are not present with you. And so a lot of times when I'm doing the work with the client, I'll just say, you know, can you use your back of the head scale and let me know where you're at right now? And so they're like, I'm just about here. And so here means I'm almost there. So that means I'm gonna do something that's gonna get them here. I want them here, I want them here. If they're here, it means they're starting to go into what potentially could be dissociative. And then as they go into the back of the head, they're not here with us at all. And measurables are really important for our clients because it's another way for them to communicate. Okay, you guys, we have five minutes left. And um, I don't know that uh, we can do questions or thoughts, um, but maybe, I don't know. Dana, do you want to take a couple questions that come up in chat or? Yeah, we could look at that. There is one right now. It says, can you engage in the OCD rigidity overeating addictions as well in hypoarousal? Can I engage in it? What is Yes, it just says, can you engage in the OCD rigidity overeating addictions as well? Well, I'll be honest with you, the hype, oh, the hype, the hyper arousal um, then transitions into hypo arousal. It's going to be, this is going to be ego states. If you have somebody who is highly addictive or um, is in an uh, eating disorder, OCD, that they're going to have parts of self parts of self that dissociate, parts of self that want to dissociate, and parts of self that are able to numb because um, you know addiction is going to be numbing, OCD is going to be numbing. So um, you're going to be able to pick up on what types of ways that they um, use the different dissociative aspects, which then speak to the behaviors. The behaviors are the solution to the problem, and the behaviors help them dissociate. So then we would just be able to get more information. But at the end of the day, you wanna be dealing with the dissociation and why the client's dissociating. If you do that, then these behaviors will dissipate. Okay, yeah, and I think There's you just no answered point. it. He, they followed up and said, does one also engage in those in hypoarousal? So I think you answered yes, that. Yes, absolutely, yep. yeah. Yep. It is a dissociative state for a lot of those, yep. Mm -hmm. um, I think. I believe that is it. And then just, oh, 
I'm sorry, just want to confirm, is it okay to use the DES with adolescents? Oh, good question, good question. I would prefer that you go on my website, emdrchicago.com, go under resources, uh, under dissociation and use the adolescent DES. There's okay. a child's DES, oh, I'm so glad you asked. There's a child's DES and an adolescent DES. The language is very different. Yeah. Okay. And then are we advised to administer the DES not only on intake, but also later in therapy to watch for changes in disassociation or shifts in type of disassociation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just please, please, please don't use it to diagnose anybody. If you need a diagnosis, um, just reach out to whoever you work with or reach out to me, emdrchicago at gmail.com. And on my website is the MID, the Multidimensional Inventory Dissociation. That is the tool that we use to diagnose DID and um, uh, DDNOS, uh, so the dissociative disorders. We also can um, uh, diagnose um, uh, PTSD with a dissociative subtype. Uh, we do some borderline personality kind of diagnosed stuff and um, uh, somatoform. So that's the tool you're gonna wanna use. This leads us to that tool. Perfect. So and it's on my okay. website if you wanna look at it. And then can ADHD inattention be also mistaken for disassociation? Yes, absolutely. In fact, yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to say it, but you know, we'll, we'll see in a couple of years what's really going on. Uh, now that, it, that the schools are becoming trauma-informed, more people are becoming trauma-informed. Yes. Okay. And do your EMDR trainings listed on your website count towards requirements for certification? Um, the training is what you need in order to get certification. So the training is the foundation and then you pick. So I showed you two trainings. One is the EMDR training. You get your certificate of completion and then you do the advanced training and that's what gets you the certification because we want to be certified in something that we're interested in and dissociation is a great, a great next topic. Okay, and I think that is all. Actually, okay. there was one that came in the chat. Um, it just said, um, oh. do you have resources on dissociation and autism? I don't um, that I can give you right now, but if you email me at emdrchicago.com, I will send you um, a couple journal articles on that. Wonderful. And there's a lot of thank you. So thank you. This has been very informative. I want to learn more. This is great. Would love to have more on this topic with more time. Thanks so much. Yay. Thank you. So interesting. Well, thank, yeah. Thanks all of you guys for taking the time. And Ryan, and Dana, thank you for having me. Yeah, you know what, Paul, I'm sorry, one more. In regards to adolescent DES, same treatments, question mark? Yes, same treatments, yeah, yeah. Perfect. They'll love it, actually. They love the big screen, picture in picture. All right, well, guys, it sounds like we will do a follow-up to this, so stay tuned for information on that, because it sounds like it's definitely needed. And thank you, Paula, as always. You're, um, we love your presentation. Yay, thank you, thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Dana, do you need me to hang on or should I? I think we are good to go. Someone's asking about um, CEUs, but we will answer all that. You will be getting an email about CEUs. Oh, okay. Good. All okay. right. All right, guys. Thank you, Thank everyone. You so much. Right. Have a fantastic day. Thanks, you Thank too. You. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.